This is Mrs. Palmer Quay, and this is the first video for Unit 4. In this video, I'll be talking about the structure and function of the skin and the various accessory structures found in the skin. So our skin is made up of three distinct layers of tissues. We have the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, which is also known as the subcutaneous. And you will notice that I am now putting the learning targets numbers over here with each section to help you in taking your notes. I apologize for the small size of the print. I've been using a variety of pre-designed slide, PowerPoint slides to try to speed up this process and uh, interesting things happen when I bring it into my iPad to make the recording. So you, this one we've got several times the, t the font is a little smaller than I intended. But anyway, back onto the functions of the skin. What does the skin do for you? Uh, first of all, the skin is an outer layer that provides some protection from injury and infection. It's a barrier. It's part of the immune system in that way. It's sort of a first line of defense, not allowing any of the bad bacteria to get through into your, your internal organs. It also is very much involved in thermoregulation, heat regulation, keeping your body at the correct temperature, part of homeostasis. Your skin, when exposed to sunlight, can produce vitamin D, which is important for building strong bones, uh, supporting your immune system, possibly cancer prevention, maybe even uh, being able to fall asleep at night. Researchers are finding more and more ways that vitamin D is um, important in our health. The skin also provides sensation. We have different receptors that give us touch and pressure sensors and temperature or pain sensors in our skin. And the skin also has a role to play in excretion and getting rid of waste products like urea and various salts and water, especially through sweat. So let's look at these layers of skin. We have the epidermis and the dermis, and together they also form the cutaneous membrane, which I'll be talking about in the membrane video. So this is where we get cutaneous versus subcutaneous, or you can talk about epidermis and dermis versus hypodermis. So there's several different words that are used to describe this part of your body. And if we look here, you can see we've got this darker stained area on the top, which is the epidermis. It's stratified squamous epithelium. Those should all make sense to you now. And then the dermis is the layer of connective tissue below. It's dense, irregular connective tissue. Irregular meaning that the fibers go off in various different directions. They don't line up. And then below that, in the uh, subcutaneous layer or the hypodermis, we have adipose tissue, fat tissue, and also often some loose connective tissue holding it all together. You'll notice that it's not a straight line between the epidermis and the dermis. We have these epidermal ridges if you're coming down from the epidermis, or dermal papillae if you're coming up from the dermis. And since the dermis is connective tissue, it's tougher, it doesn't um, compress as easily, these bumps and ridges that are part of the dermal papillae are actually what are making your fingerprints. So you can blame it all on your connective tissue, whether you have whorls or the various uh, forms of fingerprints. So looking at the epidermis in a little more uh, detail, we already talked it's stratified squamous epithelial tissue. The cells on the top are keratinized or keratinized. They are full of keratin, a very tough protein. There's somewhere between 15 and 30 layers here in the top layer of this um, dead keratinized cells. Your epidermis has different uh, degrees of thickness depending upon where it's found on your body. So it's thinnest on your eyelid and thickest on the palm of your hand and the sole of your feet. I think you could probably figure that out. There are special cells called melanocytes, which are shown as dark blue down here. And actually, this isn't a very good picture because melanocytes actually are much longer. They have little cytoplasmic fingers sticking up all over the place. And we'll talk about that when we get to um, skin color. And then we have Langerhans cells, which are listed here as dendritic cells. They are part of the immune system, capturing pathogens, uh, foreign invaders, and taking it off to the immune system to be tagged to produce um, various uh, antibodies to, to um, mark it for destruction. 
There are five distinct cell layers in the epidermis, and if you are an honors student, you need to know all five layers. If you are a non-honors anatomy and physiology student, I would like you to be sure that you know the stratum corneum, which is this uppermost layer. Those are the dead keratinized cells. This is the outer layer on our skin. If you uh, stand in a sunny spot and rub your skin hard, you can see little flakes coming off. Most of the dust in your house are um, shed skin cells. You are replacing your stratum corneum, corneum about every 25 days, so about once a month you've got a whole new set of cells on the outside of your body. The other layer that everyone needs to know is the lowermost layer the stratum basale or stratum germinativum. And these are the cells that are actively undergoing mitosis. These are where cells, new skin cells, are born. And then after they have divided, the daughter cells then are found in the next layer up, the stratum spinosum. So those two layers, the stratum basale and the stratum corneum, are the most important layers for most people to know. If you're an honor student, know that we have the stratum spinosum. These cells look a little spiny when they're stained in a particular way, so that's where the name comes from. The stratum granulosum, we're moving up then from the, the um, stratum basale down here in the bottom, we're moving up through the skin layers. In the granulosum layer, the keratin is beginning to be laid down in the skin. The stratum lucidum or lucidum is found only in the thick skin on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. And this is just an extra layer of clear keratinized cells to provide protection for those areas. So cells are born down here at the at the layer, the line between your epidermis and your dermis, and then over time they migrate to the surface of the skin, they get filled with keratin, a very tough uh, protein, and then by the time they reach the outermost layer, they are a dead, um, solidly filled with protein cell that provides a layer of protection from the bumps and scrapes and bruises that we undergo every day just going through life. Underneath the epidermis, we have a layer that's known as the dermis. This is connective tissue, so epithelial cells are in the epidermis, and connective tissue is in the dermis. Now, if you remember from our tissues video, it is the connective tissue that is vascular vascularized. The epithelial cells do not have blood vessels available to them, so the um, nutrients are dropped off in the dermis, and they have to diffuse their way up through the epithelial to the epithelial cells. So as you move further down the dermis, you're going to find more and more um, blood vessels, larger blood vessels. That's why you can cut yourself sometimes very superficially and have no blood happening because you've just cut yourself in the epidermis, but a deeper cut can bleed quite profusely. In the dermis, we have these accessory structures that we'll talk about a little bit later, hair and nail follicles, the various glands, the various sensory cells. And we also have something that this is just not even in your uh, learning targets, but it's for fun. Um, in the reticular layer, which is the lowest part here you can see of the dermis, we have things known as the lines of cleavage that are very important for surgeons and how they put cuts in your body if they have a choice so that you are less likely to have scarring. So this diagram shows various ways. The lines of cleavage are um, really closely aligned to the layers of muscle underneath, and the reticular layer in the connective tissue seems to line up with these muscles. So that, just take this um, foot for an example here over... If you had to do surgery on this foot, if you were able to make a cut going this way with the lines of cleavage, there would be less likelihood of scarring, better possibility of wound healing, because there's no tension to pull apart. But if you were making cut a cut this way across the lines of cleavage, these two sides would want to contract away from that wound, and that's when you have a greater chance of having scars form here because the um, tissue would not stay adhere together as well. There'd be more contraction going on during the healing time that would pull the tissue apart. So surgeons have to pay attention to lines of cleavage. These are also called Langer lines. That information is just for fun. Then underneath the dermis, we have the subcutaneous layer. So this is the third layer of your skin, the deepest layer. Um, it's also, as I said, known as the hypodermis. Hypo meaning under. 
It's made up of loose connective tissue and adipose tissue or fat tissue. You've got even larger blood vessels down here. And along with the, um, as, as we've seen earlier in talking about connective tissue, along with the fibroblasts that make the different types of tissue, you have mast cells that produce histamine that are involved in wound healing and allergies, and wandering macrophages or macrophages that are there as part of your immune system to grab any bacteria or pathogen that they happen to run into, and they're, they're phagocytic so they can actually engulf them and digest them so that they won't cause you any problems. What causes skin color? There's actually a combination of things. There, there's certainly a big impact from your heredity, but certain decisions you make and the environmental choices can also impact on your skin color. So genetic factors, well, melanin is produced by the melanocytes. And as we, um, going back to that very first picture, we've got these melanocytes, kind of uh, spidery looking dark cells down in the basal layer. And they are producing melanin, and basically because they have long sort of fingers of their cell extending into the skin cell, the epithelial tissue, these skin cells can grab by phagocytosis, now we think, the little bits of melanin granules that are uh, being produced by the melanocytes. And what the individual epithelial cells do is they arrange that melanin to cover over the nucleus. That's why you, are, you would tan if you were out in the sun. Your skin is producing more melanin, and your cells are arranging the, melanos the little bits of melanin as um, an umbrella covering over the nucleus because the problem with getting too much sunshine is that it can impact on the DNA found in the nucleus. It can cause mutations, um, you know, eventually potentially cause cancer. Your body has this protective response to keep the um, vitamin, or keep the vitamin, to keep the sunlight from destroying the DNA and, and having long-term repercussions. So you have different amounts of melanin that are being produced by these melanocytes based on your genetic heritage. The size of the granules that are produced are um, also different, and so if you have a lot of large melanin granules produced, your skin color will be darker than somebody who has very few small melanin granules or perhaps even is suffering from something like albinoism, which they're not producing any melanin because they don't have any melanocytes. The environmental factors that can impact on it, of course, is how much sun or tanning you are undergoing. X-rays also can darken the skin. Um, this constant exposure to these um, light waves that your body senses as being harmful to the cells will keep your production of melanin high, and so then they will, you'll have a darker skin tone. You also see some change in skin color based on whether your blood vessels have dilated or constricted. Are you hot? Are you cold? Are you embarrassed? Those things can make you look pinker or paler, depending on the situation. What you eat can also affect how you look. Um, if you're having foods that are very high in carotene, which is what gives carrots and sweet potatoes their dark uh, orange color, it can build up in your tissues. It's a challenge to do if you're an adult, but it's not very hard to do if you are a baby. Many of the jarred baby foods have sweet potatoes or carrots as a uh, first or second ingredient. They provide sweetness. They're cheap ingredients. And so if you have a child that is eating a lot of baby food, a lot of um, jarred dinners especially, they may take on a slightly orangish tinge. Uh, my first job after college was working for the Women, Infants, and Children's, the WIC program as a nutritionist, and it wasn't uncommon to see some babies that looked a little orange because they had had an overaccumulation of carotene in their skin. Stopping to eat quite so much uh, sweet potatoes and carrots would reverse the process. And then finally, if you're having health problems involving your liver, you may experience jaundice, which is a yellowish tinge to your skin. Um, it's from a buildup of bilirubin, which um, is when old blood cells are not being processed correctly. So these are physiological factors that along with environmental factors and genetic can change what your skin color looks like. So now we're moving on to some accessory structures of the skin. 
And the accessory structures, even though they may be found lower into the dermis, they actually originate from the epidermis. And they include the hair follicles, the nails, and the um, skin glands. So the hair follicles, you know that fair hair is found on your head. It provides some insulation there on your head, not so much on your bodies. There are also hairs that provide protection, filtering out um, things that may be going you know, into your respiratory system. The hairs in your nose have a protection of filtration. The hairs in your eyelashes help catch particles that might be going towards your eye. Your eyebrows help stop sweat rolling down your forehead to also keep it out of your eye. So we've got protection and filtration as being another important role of hair. And there's also hair cells in your inner ear that are involved in hearing and in balance. So there's a number of roles that hair plays, not just uh, you know making you beautiful because of the best haircut you have. Nails on the end of your fingers, of course, provide protection for the very end of your fingers. They give you a better grip so that you can carry things and move things. And, of course, if you've got an itchy spot, you're very happy to have a nail. There are several different types of skin glands. Some of them are involved in oil production, which helps keep your skin supple and not dry and keeps your outer um, layer fairly waterproof. Sweat is involved in temperature regulation. And then you've got some special glands that are actually were, they're um, developed from sweat glands, but the mammary glands, which are involved in producing milk for infants, and even earwax is produced by a particular gland. So these are all ways that the accessory structures function for your health. So let's look at these individually. Hair follicles, you can see by this pink line here from the epidermis, then it goes down around, this is a sebaceous gland. Um, and down around the hair follicle itself. So the epidermal cells actually are pushed down into the dermis in each of the hair follicles. The very down here at the bottom, we call this the hair root, and this is where mitotic cells are, where you're producing new cells, and then as they move up the hair shaft, they again take on keratin and will eventually become dead cells that are full of keratin and they're sort of um, extruded like a, a tube of toothpaste from your, your toothpaste tube out through the top of the hair follicle. So the um, color of your hair depends upon how much and there, what kind of melanin. There are several different kinds of melanin. So that the um, down here in the hair root the color of the hair, hair is picked, and then the particular arrangement of protein bonds inside your hair determine whether your hair is straight or curly. There is also a small muscle, you can see it here, that is, um, it's a retropele muscle. The erector muscle, as you would guess from the name, is what makes your hair stand up when you are scared or have goosebumps. Um, if you were a animal that had lots and lots of hair on your body, it could also be involved in providing some insulation. But for people, um, it's not a terribly important muscle, but there is one there around all of your hair shafts. The nails are very similar to the hair. The nail itself is made up of keratin, and it is a very uh, tough, a little bit tougher version than what you find in your hair, which I'm sure you would guess. The um, so the, the nail itself is known as the nail plate, and then you have the nail bed, which is the um, skin, the epidermal cells that are underneath the nail plate. If you want to think about what it would be like if we didn't have the um, stratum corneum on the outside of our body, if we didn't have that protective layer of dead keratinized cells, just think about what it feels like if you happen to cut your nail too close or if you have experienced having a nail pulled off and with this part of the epidermis is exposed, it is like what it would be if you didn't have that layer of keratinized cells. And you know that area can be very, very tender. Just imagine if you were walking around with your skin being that sensitive to the world. So just like the hair root, the nail is produced in the nail root or the lunula, lunula, sorry. The lunula is the half moon, white half moon um, coloring that you can see at the base of many of your nails. And this is where the heavily mitotic, rapidly dividing cells live. And from this point on, then your nail will grow out. If you lose a nail, but you don't damage the lunula, 
the nail will grow back perfectly normally. My uh, older son Paul had that happen. He had a nail come off in a freak accident and uh, took uh, quite a while, but eventually he regrew a new nail and you'd never know now that that one was pulled off. But if you want to stop your nail growing, if you're somebody who suffers from ingrown toenails, then the doctor can go in and kill the cells in this area, and then you will never have a, a nail again on that toe. Then we have variety of glands that are producing things that are secreted and that are involved in skin health. We're going to start with the sebaceous glands. These are known as holocrine, gra holocrine glands, and the uh, fonts on this one are just really kind of crazy. But the cells fill with their uh, secretions, and then the cells themselves completely disintegrate in a holocrine, gra holocrine gland. So the sebaceous glands, and we can see them here in the picture, are associated with hair follicles. They also sometimes just empty directly onto the skin. These are the glands that produce oil. So we, you know, talk about having oily skin. Well, it's coming from the sebaceous glands, and we call it the fancy name for that oil is sebum. It helps moisturize the skin and your hair, sometimes more than you want, especially when you're um, young uh, uh, older teenager and a young adult. And it also contains something, an antibacterial product, which actually helps provide some protection. As, as I mentioned, overactive sebaceous glands lead to acne. You also can sometimes have the gland, the, uh, the duct, which we don't see in this, this diagram here, but the duct that would be emptying out into the skin. Sometimes it can become clogged, and then you can have a lump develop under your skin as the sebum continues to build up but has nowhere to go. That's usually pretty easy to um, have it cleaned out at the doctor's office. There are no sebaceous glands on the palms of your hands or the soles of your feet, which is probably good because that would make you kind of slippery there. Another type of gland in the skin are your sweat glands or your pseudoriferous glands. These come in two different types. The eccrine glands are the ones that produce sort of the uh, non-smelly sweat. It is high in water, very aqueous, and these are found throughout our skin. They're widespread in the skin, but especially places like your forehead and um, sometimes, you know, your, your back and the palms of your hands, places that you know that you tend to sweat a lot when you're hot. These glands are down in the dermis. Here it is on the diagram, the eccrine sweat gland. And so that the uh, sweat is produced down in this coiled part, and then there's a duct that takes it to a pore on the skin. And then we have the apocrine sweat glands, which these are the ones that are found in the armpit, the axillary, and the genital areas. They are the ones that are much smellier because the secretion itself actually includes small parts of the cell's cytoplasm, so bacteria can find those uh, very tasty treats, and the bacteria are what are contributing to the odor for the, the sweat that comes from the apocrine glands. These are not necessarily secreting, even though we tend to think about our armpits um, coming out when we are sweaty, but actually there are other things that trigger the apocrine apocrine glands to secrete, um, stress being a, a big one, or um, sexual arousal, and so it's not just thermoregulation. The eccrine glands are thermoregulation. And then there are four types of senses that we have sensory cells on our skin. Again, if you're an honor student, you do need to know a little bit about these different structures. Everyone needs to know these senses, the sense of touch, the sense of pressure, the sense of temperature, and the sense of pain. The two um, specific sensory cells that are involved in touch are the Meissner corpuscle and the Merkel discs, and these are both known as encapsulated nerve endings. There's a structure on the end of the nerves that contribute to the sensing. You can see that they're found here. The, the um, Meissner corpuscles are very, very high. They're, they're riding right in those dermal papillary area or the epidermal ridge, as are the Merkel discs. So they're very close to the surface. Uh, any sort of change in vibration as you're moving across different textures will be picked up by these sensory cells. And they're, so they are the ones that pick up light touch and light, uh, you know, 
vibrations. Then the um, Pacinian corpuscles down here in the dermal area, in the dermis, are the ones that are going to take deep pressure. So, you know, a big poke would get down to these deeper receptors, and so they will respond to deeper pressure, not light touch, but deeper pressure. And then the Ruffini organ, uh, scientists are not quite sure what it is involved in. They think that it senses, it's found not only in fingertips, but um, also in your joints. And so they think it's involved in when things are stretching and moving. Possibly in your fingertips, it helps you grip things. You get a sense of, you know, are you able to really hang on to something because how your skin is stretching and moving. But it's also involved in the um, sensory the ability we have to sense where our body parts are. You know, we, without looking, can tell, is my knee bent or my, my knee is straight, my leg is straight, you know, my foot pointed. We don't have to look at our body parts. We have receptors in our joints that tell us how our body is positioned, and they think that the Ruffini organ may also be involved in that. And then there are free nerve endings. They don't have capsules on the end of them. And these are the ones that are involved in discerning temperature changes and pain. So finally, I just want to talk a minute about regulating body temperature since this is such an important part of the skin's function. In our hypothalamus in the brain, we have a certain uh, setting like the thermostat that tells the body temperature should be 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if the body temperature comes up above that, it's higher than normal, then your skin blood vessels dilate and sweat glands begin to put out, um, the eccrine sweat glands begin to put out that watery sweat, which then evaporates so that body heat is lost to the surrounding either by evaporation of sweat or just radiation because your um, capillaries have dilated and so your surface of your body is hotter overall and you just radiate out heat and so that your body temperature then drops back towards a normal setting. Or conversely, if your body temperature drops below normal, then your blood vessels will constrict and sweat glands will not impact so that body heat is conserved. The uh, Blood, the blood basically redirects into more to the core and not the extremities so that there's a lesser chance of any heat being radiated out. If body temperature continues to drop, you actually have muscles shivering, which generate body heat as, as a more um, last-ditch effort to warm up the body and hopefully bring your body temperature back towards normal. So the skin is involved because the blood vessels will dilate or constrict at the surface because the skin's glands will produce sweat. Um, those are all involved in this regulation of body temperature. And finally, this is um, required for honor students, but everybody can probably relate to this. You, I'm sure you know somebody who is older and maybe have already seen some of the ways that your skin does change as you age. Your epidermal cells become thinner. There are not less of them. They're still the same number, but they, they are not as large. And also the sebaceous glands produce less oil. So overall, that makes skin that is much more likely to be dry and itchy. And older people, their skin appears almost translucent. It seems much more see-through if they are very fair-skinned. You have fewer melanocytes, but they tend to be larger as you age, and so then you get these large pigmented spots that are known as age spots, or sometimes they're called liver spots, um, especially on parts of the skin that have been exposed to the sun in the past, the uh, hands and the forearms or the face. This connective tissue begins to break down, and so you lose strength and elasticity in the skin. If your skin has been exposed to the sun, it takes often takes on a leathery appearance. The blood vessels themselves become more fragile and the subcutaneous flat, fat layer decreases. So this increases the risk of injury, even from very minor bumps and bruises. The uh, resulting bruising can be much more severe in an older person. And because the fat layer has decreased, People have a harder time with temperature regulation and may suffer from hypothermia, becoming too cold, 
but also their sweat glands produce less, less sweat, and so there is an equal risk for hyperthermia in hot weather. So you're kind of hit on both sides as you age. You can't keep warm and you can't get cold. Um, and that's why you'll hear warnings about when our temperatures are so high that the elderly need to, you know, stay indoors, stay in air conditioning, don't go out because their bodies are less able to deal with the heat. And overall wound healing slows down quite a bit, so it takes a lot longer for things to heal. If you add that to um, an injury to connective tissue where it's slow anyway, you can understand that for an older person, you know, recovering from some injury can really be a very lengthy process. So that finishes what I wanted to cover in this overview of the skin and the accessory structures. There will be another video talking about body membranes and a third video talking about the um, burns and the skin disorder of skin cancer.